Hey, future RNs. Welcome to our 4,500 NCLEX question series. Today, we're covering the board's top questions, repeated over five times in five years, shared by students who passed NCLEX and are now RNs. Stick around for the 3033 rule. Watch 30 videos three times and you'll pass NCLEX in 30 days. Let's start today's test. Let us move to the first question. This newborn-related question has been asked six times over the last five years, making it likely to appear in the exam. The nurse is caring for a newborn that is two hours old and at risk for cold stress. Which of the following findings would suggest an early sign of cold stress? A. Shivering. B. Elevated blood sugar levels. C. Rapid heartbeat. D. Slow breathing rate. The correct answer is C. Rapid heartbeat. C is correct. In cold stress, an infant's body reacts to the drop in temperature by constricting blood vessels, also known as peripheral vasoconstriction, which leads to an increase in heart rate as the heart works harder to maintain warmth and oxygenate tissues. Rapid heartbeat, also known as tachycardia, along with faster breathing and bluish discoloration of the extremities, also known as cyanosis, are key signs of early cold stress. AI is incorrect. Infants do not develop the ability to shiver for heat generation until around six months of age, so shivering would not be expected in a newborn. A two-hour-old infant cannot shiver as a response to cold stress. B is incorrect. Cold stress leads to an increase in metabolic demand, which typically results in low blood glucose, also known as hypoglycemia, not high blood sugar, also known as hyperglycemia. Therefore, it is important to monitor glucose levels when an infant experiences cold stress. D is incorrect. Cold stress would more likely lead to fast breathing, also known as tachypnea as the infant's body attempts to meet higher oxygen demands due to increased metabolism. Slow breathing, also known as bradypnea, would be a late and more severe sign of distress. Let us move on to the next question. This Bucks traction-related question has been asked seven times over the last five years, making it a likely candidate for your exam. The nurse is caring for a client who is in Buck's traction. Which of the following actions should the nurse take? A. Make sure the weight applied is between 15 to 30 pounds, which is 6.8 to 13.6 kilograms. B. Turn the client from side to side using a foam wedge every two hours. C. Ensure that the client's heels are supported on a pillow. D. Raise the foot of the bed to create counter-traction. The correct answer is D. Raise the foot of the bed to create counter-traction. D is correct. Buck's traction is used to provide continuous pulling force to treat fractures or conditions such as hip dislocation. Elevating the foot of the bed helps create counter-traction, which is necessary to keep the client from sliding down and to maintain the correct alignment of the affected limb. A is incorrect. In skin traction, like Bucks, the weight should be lighter, typically no more than 5 to 10 pounds, which is 2.3 to 4.5 kilograms, to avoid damaging the skin. Heavier weights are used in skeletal traction, where metal pins or screws are inserted into the bones. B is incorrect. Clients in traction should not be turned from side to side, as this could disturb the traction and affect the alignment of the injured extremity. Instead, the client should be kept in a neutral position to allow the traction to work effectively. C is incorrect. Placing a pillow under the heels can increase the risk of developing pressure ulcers. The heels should hang freely off the edge of the bed or pillow to reduce the chance of skin breakdown. Let us continue with the next question. This potassium replacement question has been asked five times over the last five years and has a strong chance of appearing in the exam. 
a nurse is administering intravenous potassium to a patient with a potassium level of 3.1 milliequivalents per liter. Normal range is 3.5 to 5 milliequivalents per liter. Which of the following would indicate the potassium replacement is having the desired effect? A. Normal bowel sounds. B. Flattened T waves on an electrocardiogram, also known as an EKG. C. Decreased deep tendon reflexes. D. Muscle spasms. The correct answer is A. Normal bowel sounds. A is correct. Low potassium levels, also known as hypokalemia, can cause reduced bowel motility, leading to hypoactive or absent bowel sounds. Normal bowel sounds, indicating the return of normal intestinal function, would suggest that potassium replacement therapy has successfully restored normal potassium levels and improved gastrointestinal motility. B is incorrect. Flattened T waves are a sign of ongoing hypokalemia, and seeing this on an EKG would suggest that the potassium has not yet reached therapeutic levels. C is incorrect. Decreased deep tendon reflexes are associated with low potassium and are not indicative of recovery. Restoring normal potassium levels should improve neuromuscular function, not worsen it. D is incorrect. Muscle cramping and spasms are common symptoms of hypokalemia, so their presence would indicate that the potassium levels are still too low and the therapeutic effect has not yet been achieved. Let us move to the next question. This digoxin dosage calculation question has been asked six times over the last five years, making it a frequent topic in exams. A healthcare provider orders 0.375 milligrams of digoxin to be administered intravenously. The vial available contains digoxin at 0.25 milligrams per milliliter. How many milliliters of digoxin should the nurse administer to deliver the correct dose? A. 1 milliliter. B. 1.5 milliliters. C. 2 milliliters. D. 0 0.75 milliliters. The correct answer is B. 1.5 milliliters. Rationale. In this scenario, the nurse needs to calculate how many milliliters of digoxin solution should be administered to provide the ordered dose of 0.375 milligrams. The available vial contains digoxin with a concentration of 0.25 milligrams per milliliter. To calculate the volume to be administered, the nurse should use the formula dose ordered divided by dose on hand equals the volume to be administered. Dose ordered. 0.375 milligrams. Dose on hand, 0.25 milligrams per milliliter. Now, divide the dose ordered by the concentration on hand. 0.375 milligrams divided by 0.25 milligrams per milliliter equals 1.5 milliliters. Therefore, the nurse should administer 1.5 milliliters of the digoxin solution to deliver the prescribed dose of 0.375 milligrams. The formula ensures that the correct amount of medication is given based on the available concentration. Let us continue with the next question. This inoxaparin-related question has been asked four times over the last five years, making it moderately likely to appear in the exam. A patient is prescribed enoxaparin, which is a low molecular weight heparin. Which laboratory value should the nurse monitor to assess for potential complications? A. Platelet count. B. Activated partial thromboplastin time, also known as APTT. C. International normalized ratio, also known as INR. D. Troponin. The correct answer is A, platelet count. A is correct. One of the most serious complications of anoxaparin is heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, also known as HIT, where the platelet count drops by more than 50%. Monitoring platelet levels is essential to detect this condition early, 
as it can lead to dangerous blood clots despite the low platelet count. B is incorrect. While the activated partial thromboplastin time, or APTT, is used to monitor unfractionated heparin, it is not required for enoxaparin. This medication does not typically affect APTT levels. C is incorrect. The International Normalized Ratio, or INR, is used to monitor warfarin therapy, not enoxaparin, as they affect the coagulation system differently. D is incorrect. Troponin is a marker for myocardial infarction and is not relevant to monitoring the effects of anoxaparin, which is used primarily for preventing blood clots. Let us move to the next question. This doxorubicin-related question has been asked five times over the last five years and may appear again in the exam. The nurse is caring for a patient receiving doxorubicin. Which of the following findings requires immediate follow-up by the nurse? A. Loss of appetite. B. Fever. C. Hair loss. D. General fatigue. The correct answer is B. Fever. B is correct. Doxorubicin is a chemotherapy drug that can cause myelosuppression, leading to pancytopenia, which is a decrease in white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. A fever is a critical sign because it may indicate infection, and patients with low white blood cell counts, known as leukopenia, are at high risk of sepsis. Immediate follow-up is required to assess for infection and initiate treatment if necessary. A, C, and D are incorrect. Anorexia, alopecia, and malaise are common and expected side effects of chemotherapy, including doxorubicin. While these symptoms can affect the quality of life, they are not as immediately concerning as a fever, which could signify a life-threatening infection. Let us proceed to the next question. This medication reconciliation question has been asked six times in the last five years and could likely appear in the exam. The nurse is preparing a staff development session on medication reconciliation. Which of the following key points should be included? A. Medication reconciliation only needs to be completed at discharge. B. Only prescribed medications need to be documented, not herbal supplements. C. Medication reconciliation should occur at admission, during transfers, and at discharge. D. The nurse should gather a list of medications without involving the patient directly. The correct answer is C. Medication reconciliation should occur at admission, during transfers, and at discharge. C is correct. Medication reconciliation is a process designed to ensure continuity of care and prevent medication errors by comparing the medications a patient is taking before admission, during hospital transfers, and at discharge. This process helps prevent omissions, duplications, and interactions. The patient's medications, including prescription, over-the-counter, and herbal supplements, should all be considered. A is incorrect. Reconciliation should occur not just at discharge, but also at admission and when patients are transferred between units or healthcare facilities. This ensures that medication errors are minimized throughout the patient's care. B is incorrect. Herbal supplements and over-the-counter drugs can interact with prescribed medications and must be included in the reconciliation process. D is incorrect. It is crucial to involve the patient in the reconciliation process to verify the accuracy of the medication list. The patient's input ensures that the healthcare team has a complete understanding of the medications the patient has been taking. Let us move to the next question. This transesophageal echocardiogram, or TEE, related question has been asked five times in the last five years, so there is a good chance it will appear in the exam. A nurse is explaining the upcoming transesophageal echocardiogram, or TEE, procedure to a client. Which statement from the client demonstrates an accurate understanding of the nurse's teaching? A. I will need to take antibiotics for a week after the test. B. This test can help identify if I have any blood clots in my heart. C. 
I will be under general anesthesia during the procedure. D. I might feel warm when they inject the dye. The correct answer is B. This test can help identify if I have any blood clots in my heart. B is correct. A transesophageal echocardiogram, or TEE, provides detailed images of the heart, especially the left atrial appendage, which is a common site for blood clots. This test is often done before procedures like cardioversion to check for the presence of clots that could lead to complications. A is incorrect. Antibiotics are not routinely required for a transesophageal echocardiogram, or TEE, unless there is a specific risk of infection, which is uncommon for this type of procedure. C is incorrect. General anesthesia is not used. Instead, the client typically receives moderate sedation, which keeps them relaxed but conscious enough to maintain their airway. D is incorrect. A transesophageal echocardiogram, or TEE, does not involve contrast dye. Instead, it uses ultrasound technology to create images, so the client will not experience sensations related to dye injection. Let us move on to the next question. This cerebral palsy-related question has been asked four times in the last five years, making it moderately likely to appear in the exam. While observing a new nurse care for a child with cerebral palsy, the supervising nurse identifies which action that requires immediate correction. A. Initiating gentle range of motion exercises to prevent joint stiffness. B. Lowering the bed to its lowest level to reduce fall risk. C. Transporting the child to the playroom in a wheelchair. D. Feeding the child with the bed raised only 30 degrees. The correct answer is D. Feeding the child with the bed raised only 30 degrees. D is correct. Children with cerebral palsy often have difficulty swallowing and controlling oral secretions, increasing the risk of aspiration during feeding. The head of the bed should be elevated to at least 45 degrees, not 30 degrees, during feeding to minimize the risk of aspiration. A is incorrect. Range of motion exercises are essential for children with cerebral palsy to prevent contractures, and it is a proper intervention. B is incorrect. Lowering the bed is a safety measure that reduces the risk of injury in case of a fall and is a good nursing practice. C is incorrect. Encouraging play and social interaction is important for children with cerebral palsy, and using a wheelchair to transport the child to the playroom is appropriate. Let us proceed to the next question. This developmental reflex question has been asked three times in the past five years, so it might show up in the examination. At what age range does the Moro reflex typically disappear in an infant? A. Three to six months. B. One to three months. C. Seven to nine months. D. Ten to twelve months. The correct answer is A. Three to six months. A is correct. The Moro reflex, an automatic response to a sudden loss of support, starts to fade between three and six months of age. If the reflex persists beyond this period, it may suggest a neurological issue. B is incorrect. The reflex typically lasts longer than the first one to three months and should not disappear that early. C is incorrect. By seven to nine months, the Moro reflex should have disappeared. Persistence at this age could indicate developmental concerns. D is incorrect. The reflex should not be present at 10 to 12 months, as it normally fades much earlier. Let us move on to the next question. This paracentesis-related question has been asked six times in the last five years, making it highly probable to appear in the examination. After assisting with a paracentesis, what is the nurse's primary focus for client care? A. Administering pain medication for post-procedure discomfort. B. Monitoring for signs of infection at the puncture site. C. Checking for signs of low blood pressure and volume depletion. D. Sending the fluid sample to the laboratory for analysis. 
The correct answer is C. Checking for signs of low blood pressure and volume depletion. C is correct. A major complication following paracentesis, particularly when large amounts of fluid are drained, is hypovolemia, low blood volume, due to rapid shifts in fluid. Monitoring for symptoms such as pallor, low blood pressure, tachycardia, and decreased urine output is critical. A is incorrect. Pain control is important, but it is not the top priority since hypovolemia poses a more immediate threat. B is incorrect. Infection is a potential risk, but it usually develops later rather than immediately after the procedure. D is incorrect. Sending the fluid for analysis is part of the process, but client safety through monitoring for hypovolemic shock takes precedence over laboratory work. Let us continue to the next question. This patient-controlled analgesia-related question has been asked seven times in the last five years, making it a high-probability topic for the examination. After attending an educational session on patient-controlled analgesia, which statement by the nurse demonstrates proper understanding? A. A loading dose may be given before the client begins self-administering medication. B. Patient-controlled analgesia is generally avoided for clients with acute pain. C. Using a patient-controlled analgesia reduces the need for regular pain assessments. D. A continuous basal rate decreases the likelihood of side effects. The correct answer is A. A loading dose may be given before the client begins self-administering medication. A is correct. A loading dose of pain medication is often administered at the beginning of patient-controlled analgesia therapy to achieve rapid pain relief before the client takes control of self-administration. B is incorrect. Patient-controlled analgesia is effective for both acute and chronic pain, providing clients with a sense of control over their pain management. C is incorrect. Pain assessments remain essential when using patient-controlled analgesia to ensure that the therapy is effective and that the client is not experiencing adverse effects. D is incorrect. A continuous basal rate can increase the risk of side effects, such as respiratory depression, since the client is receiving medication even when they may not need it. This diabetic ketoacidosis, insulin infusion calculation question, has been asked five times in the last five years, making it a frequently repeated question in examinations. The healthcare provider prescribes a continuous infusion of regular insulin for a client experiencing diabetic ketoacidosis. The prescribed dose is two units per hour. The insulin infusion is mixed with 100 units of insulin and 250 milliliters of normal saline. How many milliliters per hour should the client receive? A, 10 milliliters per hour. B, five milliliters per hour. C, eight milliliters per hour. D. 2 milliliters per hour. Correct answer? B. 5 milliliters per hour. To calculate the infusion rate, 1. First, find out how many milliliters of the solution will provide one unit of insulin. 250 milliliters divided by 100 units equals 2.5 milliliters per unit. 2. Then, multiply the required dose of 2 units by 2.5 milliliters per unit. 2 units multiplied by 2.5 milliliters per unit equals 5 milliliters per hour. So, the client should receive 5 milliliters per hour to deliver the correct dose of 2 units per hour. This rate is important for managing diabetic ketoacidosis by lowering blood glucose and reducing ketone production. This compartment syndrome-related question has been asked six times in the last five years, making it a high-probability question on the examination. A client sustained a right leg fracture from an industrial accident and now reports severe pain and tingling beneath a newly applied plaster cast. The nurse also observes that the exposed toes are cyanotic. What is the most appropriate action by the nurse? A. Apply heat packs to the affected leg. B. Elevate the affected limb. 
C. Notify the healthcare provider immediately. D. Encourage the client to wiggle their toes. The correct answer is C. Notify the healthcare provider immediately. C is correct. The client's symptoms of severe pain, tingling, and cyanosis suggest the development of acute compartment syndrome. This is a medical emergency in which increased pressure within the muscle compartments restricts blood flow and leads to tissue ischemia. Left untreated, compartment syndrome can cause permanent damage to muscles and nerves and in severe cases may necessitate amputation. The nurse must immediately contact the healthcare provider to facilitate urgent cast removal or surgical intervention, fasciotomy, to relieve the pressure. A is incorrect because applying heat would exacerbate the condition by causing vasodilation, which can increase swelling and worsen the pressure inside the compartment. B is incorrect because elevating the limb could reduce arterial blood flow, further compromising circulation, and worsening ischemia. D is incorrect because encouraging movement would delay appropriate intervention and could worsen the ischemic condition, increasing the risk of permanent damage. This performance evaluation bias prevention question has been asked four times in the last five years, making it moderately likely to appear in the examination. A nursing supervisor is preparing to conduct performance evaluations of the staff nurses. What is the best approach to minimize bias during the evaluation process? A. Compare the nurse's performance with that of another nurse. B. Base the evaluation on a particularly positive experience. C. Review the nurse's previous evaluations before the new evaluation. D. Gather feedback from the nurse's peers regarding skills, attitude, and competencies. The correct answer is D. Gather feedback from the nurses. Peers regarding skills, attitude, and competencies. D is correct. To minimize bias, using a 360-degree feedback method that includes input from multiple sources such as peers, subordinates, and supervisors offers a more comprehensive and objective view of the nurse's performance. This method provides a well-rounded evaluation and reduces the risk of the supervisor relying solely on personal impressions, which can be biased by isolated events. A is incorrect because comparing one nurse's performance to another's creates bias, as each nurse should be evaluated based on their individual performance and goals rather than a direct comparison. B is incorrect because focusing on a single positive event distorts the overall evaluation. Performance appraisals should be balanced and take into account the nurse's work over the entire evaluation period. C is incorrect because reviewing past evaluations can introduce bias by predisposing the supervisor to expect the same level of performance. Each evaluation should focus solely on the nurse's current performance. This electroconvulsive therapy, electroconvulsive therapy, patient education question has been asked seven times in the last five years, making it highly probable to show up in the exam. A nurse is preparing a client for their first session of electroconvulsive therapy, electroconvulsive therapy. The client's spouse asks whether they can visit the client after the procedure. How should the nurse respond? A. You can visit as long as you wear a mask to prevent infection. B. You may visit, but be aware that your spouse might experience some seizures afterward. C. You can visit, but you will need to wear a lead apron and stay six feet away. D. You may visit, but your spouse might experience some short-term memory problems after the procedure. The correct answer is D. You may visit, but your spouse might experience some short-term memory problems after the procedure. Option D is correct. After electroconvulsive therapy, electroconvulsive therapy, it is common for clients to experience temporary side effects, including short-term memory loss, confusion, headaches, and drowsiness. Memory loss is usually mild and resolves over time, but family members should be informed that this is a possible effect immediately following the procedure. Visitors are encouraged to provide emotional support, 
but they should be prepared for some temporary cognitive effects in the client. Option A is incorrect because electroconvulsive therapy, electroconvulsive therapy does not increase the risk of infection, so there is no need for visitors to wear masks. Standard precautions are sufficient unless otherwise indicated by the client's health status. Option B is incorrect because clients do not typically experience seizures after electroconvulsive therapy, electroconvulsive therapy. While the procedure itself induces a brief, controlled seizure under general anesthesia, post-electroconvulsive therapy, electroconvulsive therapy, seizures are not expected. Option C is incorrect because wearing a lead apron and maintaining distance is a precaution taken during radiation treatments such as brachytherapy, not electroconvulsive therapy, electroconvulsive therapy. This heroin use risk education question has been asked three times in the last five years, making it moderately likely to appear in the exam. A nurse is educating a group of adolescents about the risks associated with heroin use. Which statement by an adolescent indicates the need for further clarification? A. Heroin use can lead to addiction and dependence, making it very hard to stop. B. Injecting heroin can increase the risk of getting diseases like HIV and hepatitis. C. Heroin can cause severe respiratory depression, which can be deadly. D. Using heroin with friends at a party is safer than using it alone. The correct answer is D. Using heroin with friends at a party is safer than using it alone. Option D is correct. The belief that using heroin in a social setting is safer than using it alone is a dangerous misconception. Heroin use carries significant risks regardless of the context, including the possibility of overdose, respiratory depression, and death. Using heroin with others does not reduce these risks and can provide a false sense of security. The presence of friends may not prevent an overdose, and emergency medical care might still be delayed. Option A is incorrect because heroin is highly addictive and regular use can lead to both physical and psychological dependence. Users often find it difficult to stop due to the withdrawal symptoms and the brain's craving for the drug. Option B is incorrect because injecting heroin with shared needles significantly increases the risk of contracting blood-borne infections such as human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, and hepatitis B or C. These infections are spread through contaminated blood. Option C is incorrect because heroin is a powerful central nervous system depressant, and one of its most dangerous effects is respiratory depression, which can lead to death if untreated. Overdoses are common, especially when heroin is combined with other depressants like alcohol or benzodiazepines. This psychological defense mechanism-related question has been asked four times in the last five years, making it moderately likely to show up on the exam. A client admitted to the behavioral health unit is reporting sudden blindness after witnessing a traumatic accident. The nurse suspects which defense mechanism is at play. A. Suppression. B. Conversion. C. Displacement. D dissociation? The correct answer is B. Conversion. Option B is correct. Conversion disorder involves the expression of psychological stress through physical symptoms with no identifiable medical cause. In this case, the client's blindness, which occurred after witnessing a traumatic event, represents the transformation of emotional distress into a physical symptom. The client is likely unaware of the connection between the psychological trauma and the sudden onset of blindness. Option A is incorrect because suppression involves consciously choosing to avoid thinking about a distressing situation. It is not associated with physical symptoms like blindness. Option C is incorrect because displacement refers to redirecting emotions from the original source of stress to a less threatening target. 
but it does not involve physical symptoms. Option D is incorrect because dissociation involves a disruption in consciousness, memory, or perception where the individual detaches from reality to avoid emotional stress. While dissociation can result in amnesia or depersonalization, it does not typically manifest as sensory deficits like blindness. This hematopoietic stem cell transplant-related question has been asked five times in the last five years, making it a key topic for exams. A nurse is planning care for a client who has recently undergone a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Which of the following medications is the nurse most likely to anticipate the healthcare provider prescribing? A. Desmopressine. B. Montelukast. C. Zidovudine. D. Azithromycin. The correct answer is D. Azithromycin. Option D is correct. Following a hematopoietic stem cell transplant, clients are at a high risk of infections due to immunosuppression. Azithromycin, a macrolide antibiotic, is often prescribed prophylactically to prevent infections, particularly respiratory infections like pneumonia. Its strong lung penetration makes it an ideal choice for preventing and treating pulmonary complications in immunocompromised clients. Option A is incorrect because desmopressin is used to treat diabetes insipidus and bleeding disorders, but it has no role in preventing infections after stem cell transplantation. Option B is incorrect because Montelukast is a leukotriene receptor antagonist used in managing asthma and allergic rhinitis, not in preventing infections after a transplant. Option C is incorrect because Zetavudine is an antiviral medication used in the treatment of human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, not for prophylaxis following a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Although antivirals may be prescribed, Zetavudine is not typically used for this purpose. More commonly prescribed antivirals in this setting include acyclovir or valacyclovir. Let's move to the next question. This parenting and infant care-related question has been asked five times in the last five years, indicating that it is quite likely to appear in your exam. The parent of a two-month-old baby expresses concern to the nurse, stating that they have been told picking the baby up immediately when crying will spoil the child. What is the best response from the nurse? A. It is okay to let your baby cry for a while before picking them up. B. Responding to your baby's cries by comforting and holding them will not spoil them. C. Your baby is probably crying because they are hungry, so you should feed them right away. D. You can let your baby cry until they stop on their own, as it will teach them to self-soothe. The correct answer is B. Responding to your baby's cries by comforting and holding them will not spoil them. Option B is correct. Infants at this age have a strong need for security, and responding to their cries by comforting and holding them helps build trust and attachment. Research has shown that meeting a baby's emotional needs in infancy does not lead to spoiling, but rather promotes a sense of safety and bonding, which is crucial for their development. Option A is incorrect. Letting the baby cry without responding promptly does not meet their need for comfort and security. Babies cry to communicate their needs, and not responding can lead to increased distress. Option C is incorrect. While hunger is one reason why a baby may cry, it is not the only reason. Assuming every cry is due to hunger may lead to overfeeding, which can cause other health issues. Option D is incorrect. Allowing an infant to cry without response can cause unnecessary stress for the child. Infants are not capable of self-soothing, and prolonged crying may affect their emotional well-being and attachment with caregivers. Let us move on to the next question. This medication-related safety question has been asked six times in the last five years, 
indicating a high chance it will be seen in your exam. The nurse is reviewing treatment plans for patients. Which prescription would require the nurse to seek clarification? Option A. Administering albuterol via nebulizer for a patient diagnosed with low potassium levels, hypokalemia. Option B. Prescribing clozapine for a patient with treatment-resistant schizophrenia. Option C. Initiating lisinopril therapy for a patient with heart failure. Option D. Using verapamil as a preventive measure for a patient with chronic migraines. The correct answer is option A. Administering albuterol via nebulizer for a patient diagnosed with low potassium levels, hypokalemia. Option A is correct. Albuterol, a bronchodilator used for asthma, has a side effect of lowering potassium levels. For a patient already diagnosed with low potassium levels, hypokalemia, the use of albuterol could worsen this condition, leading to dangerous complications such as irregular heartbeats, cardiac arrhythmias. The nurse should clarify this prescription to avoid worsening the patient's electrolyte imbalance. Option B is incorrect. Clozapine is an atypical antipsychotic often reserved for treatment-resistant schizophrenia and can be used safely with proper monitoring. Option C is incorrect. Lisinopril, an angiotensin-converting enzyme, ACE inhibitor, is commonly used in heart failure and high blood pressure, hypertension, and is appropriate for this condition. Option D is incorrect. Verapamil is a calcium channel blocker used off-label as a migraine preventive and is appropriate for this purpose. Let us continue with the next question. This anxiety management question has been asked seven times in the last five years, making it a frequent exam question. A nurse is managing the care of a client diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder, abbreviated as JAD. Which medication is the nurse most likely to anticipate being prescribed for this condition? Option A, haloperidol. Option B, flufenazine. Option C, buspirone. Option D, methylphenidate. The correct answer is option C, buspirone. Option C is correct. Buspirone is an anxiety-reducing medication, anxiolytic, that is approved by the United States Food and Drug Administration, FDA, specifically for the treatment of generalized anxiety disorder. It works by affecting serotonin and dopamine receptors in the brain, helping to reduce anxiety symptoms without the sedative effects associated with benzodiazepines. Option A and option B are incorrect. Haloperidol and flufenazine are antipsychotic medications used primarily for schizophrenia and psychotic disorders, not anxiety. Option D is incorrect. Methylphenidate is a stimulant used to treat attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, and narcolepsy, and it can increase anxiety, making it inappropriate for generalized anxiety disorder. Let us proceed to the next question. This emergency contraception question has been asked four times in the last five years, making it moderately likely to appear in your exam. A client arrives at the clinic inquiring about options for emergency contraception. What medication is the nurse most likely to expect the healthcare provider to prescribe? Option A, Levanor Gestrel. Option B, Tamoxifen. Option C, Finasteride. Option D, methotrexate. The correct answer is option A, Levon or Gestrel. Option A is correct. Levon or Gestrel is a commonly used form of emergency contraception, effective if taken within 72 hours of unprotected sexual intercourse. It works by delaying ovulation and is widely available. Option B is incorrect. Tamoxifen is used in breast cancer treatment and has no role in contraception. Option C is incorrect. Finasteride is used for benign prostatic hyperplasia, also known as BPH, and male pattern baldness, not contraception. Option D is incorrect. 
Methotrexate is used for managing ectopic pregnancies, not for emergency contraception. Let us move to the next question. This medication education question has been asked eight times in the last five years, making it highly probable to appear in the exam. A nurse has provided discharge instructions to a client who has been prescribed a clonidine transdermal patch. Which statement by the client would indicate that further education is required? Option A. I can keep this patch on when I take a shower. Option B. I should replace this patch every five days. Option C. I might feel a bit drowsy while using this medication. Option D. I need to remove this patch if I ever need to get a magnetic resonance imaging scan, abbreviated as MRI. The correct answer is option B. I should replace this patch every five days. Option B is correct. The clonidine patch should be replaced every seven days, not every five days. Changing it too often can lead to medication, overdose, or waste. Option A is incorrect. Clonidine patches are waterproof, so it is safe to wear them during activities like showering. Option C is incorrect. Drowsiness is a common side effect, which the client should be aware of. Option D is incorrect. The clonidine patch contains metal, which can interfere with MRI scans, so the client must remove it before undergoing an MRI. Let us move on to the next question. This emergency appendicitis-related question has been asked six times in the last five years, showing a high probability of appearing in the exam. While monitoring a patient suspected of having appendicitis, the nurse overhears the patient speaking with a family member. Which comment would require immediate intervention? Option A. The pain has eased up now. Maybe it was not anything serious after all. Option B. Could you bring me an ice pack to help with the pain? Option C. I know I am not supposed to eat, but I am getting really hungry. Option D. Do you think I will be able to play basketball in a couple of days? The correct answer is option A. The pain has eased up now. Maybe it was not anything serious after all. Option A is correct. A sudden reduction in pain can indicate a ruptured appendix, a surgical emergency. Rupture can lead to inflammation of the tissue lining the abdomen, known as peritonitis, requiring immediate intervention. Option B is incorrect. Requesting an ice pack is not concerning and may help alleviate pain. However, heat should be avoided. Option C is incorrect. Although the patient should remain without food or drink, NPO. Expressing hunger is not an immediate cause for concern. Option D is incorrect. Wondering about future activities like basketball is not a reason for immediate intervention. Let us move on to the next question. This safety-related question has been asked seven times in the last five years, making it a frequent and important topic for the exam. A nurse is caring for a patient who is experiencing an acute episode of vertigo. Which nursing action should take priority? Option A. Advise the patient to avoid sudden or jerky movements. Option B. Request an order for an antihistamine to reduce vertigo symptoms. Option C. Ensure the upper side rails of the patient's bed are raised. Option D. Check the patient for any signs of nausea and vomiting. The correct answer is option C. Ensure the upper side rails of the patient's bed are raised. Option C is correct. The priority in managing vertigo is preventing falls due to dizziness and imbalance. Raising the side rails helps ensure the patient's safety. Option A is incorrect. Advising the patient to avoid sudden movements is important but secondary to ensuring immediate safety. Option B is incorrect. Administering medication is secondary to safety measures. Option D is incorrect. Checking for nausea and vomiting is part of the overall management of vertigo, but does not take priority over safety measures. Let's move to the next question. 
This sepsis-related dosage calculation question has been asked four times in the last five years, making it moderately likely to appear in your exam. A patient suspected of having sepsis has been prescribed an infusion of 0.9% saline at a rate of 30 milliliters per kilogram of body weight. The patient weighs 236 pounds. What is the total volume of saline that the nurse should administer? A. 3,218 milliliters. B. 2,500 milliliters. C. 2,700 milliliters. D. 2,800 milliliters. The correct answer is A, 3,218 milliliters. To solve this, the first step is to convert the patient's weight from pounds to kilograms by dividing the number of pounds by 2.2, since one kilogram equals approximately 2.2 pounds. 236 pounds divided by 2.2 equals 107.27 kilograms. Next, the prescribed dosage of 30 milliliters per kilogram should be multiplied by the patient's weight in kilograms. 30 milliliters multiplied by 107.27 kilograms equals 3,218.1 milliliters. Finally, rounding the result gives 3,218 milliliters as the total volume of saline the nurse should administer. This approach ensures the patient receives the correct fluid volume based on their body weight, which is essential in managing sepsis effectively. Let's move on to the next question. This childhood development-related question has been asked six times in the last five years, so there is a strong likelihood that it will be on your exam. A nurse is assessing a 10-year-old child who experiences difficulties with reading, recognizing words, and processing written language despite normal intelligence. What condition does this most likely represent? A. Phonological processing disorder. B. Dyslexia. C. Tourette's syndrome. D. Apraxia. The correct answer is B. Dyslexia. B is correct because dyslexia is characterized by difficulties in reading, interpreting words, and recognizing letters and symbols, even when a child's overall intelligence is unaffected. It typically manifests in school-aged children who may require additional support in reading comprehension and literacy development. A is incorrect because a phonological processing disorder involves difficulty in distinguishing and processing sounds in spoken language, but it is not directly related to reading comprehension or symbol recognition. C is incorrect because Tourette's syndrome involves involuntary motor and vocal tics and is unrelated to reading or symbol processing issues. D is incorrect because apraxia is a motor disorder that impairs the ability to perform coordinated movements, typically affecting speech and purposeful actions, but it does not involve difficulties with reading or symbol interpretation. Let's move to the next question. This post-operative care question has been asked five times in the last five years, which means it is fairly likely to appear in your exam. After undergoing a partial gastrectomy, A patient is at risk for a specific vitamin deficiency. Which medication should the nurse expect the healthcare provider to prescribe to prevent this deficiency? A. Cyanocobalamin B. Metoclopramide C. Sucralfate D. Hydroxazine The correct answer is A. Cyanocobalamin A is correct because following a partial gastrectomy, the patient may be at risk of developing pernicious anemia due to the reduced ability to absorb vitamin B12 from food. Cyanocobalamin, vitamin B12, is often prescribed as an intramuscular or subcutaneous injection to prevent or treat B12 deficiency and should be continued indefinitely. B is incorrect because metoclopramide is a medication used to enhance gastric motility and manage nausea, but it is not specifically related to preventing B12 deficiency. C is incorrect because sucralfate is used to protect the lining of the stomach by coating ulcers, but it is not indicated for treating or preventing B12 deficiency. 
D is incorrect because hydroxyzine is an antihistamine primarily used for allergies or anxiety, and it has no role in managing the effects of a gastrectomy or preventing vitamin B12 deficiency. Let's proceed to the next question. This pre-diabetes management question has been asked seven times in the last five years, making it highly probable that you will encounter it in the exam. A nurse is evaluating a client with prediabetes to determine if they are meeting their health goals. Which of the following lab results would indicate that the client is successfully managing their condition? A. Total cholesterol of 215 mg per deciliter, 5.55 millimoles per liter. B. Hemoglobin A1c of 5.4%. C. Fasting blood glucose of 128 mg per deciliter, 7.10 millimoles per liter. D. Random blood glucose of 210 mg per deciliter, 11.66 millimoles per liter. The correct answer is B. Hemoglobin A1c of 5.4%. B is correct because a hemoglobin A1c of 5.4% falls within the normal range, indicating that the client is successfully controlling their blood sugar levels. Hemoglobin A1c reflects the average blood glucose levels over the past two to three months, with a range of 5.7% to 6.4% indicating prediabetes. A is incorrect because a total cholesterol of 215 mg per deciliter is slightly elevated as levels above 200 mg per deciliter are considered high and may increase the risk of cardiovascular complications. C is incorrect because a fasting blood glucose level of 128 mg per deciliter is above the normal range of 70 to 110 mg per deciliter indicating impaired fasting glucose, a common indicator of prediabetes or diabetes. D is incorrect because a random blood glucose reading of 210 mg per deciliter is also elevated and exceeds the threshold for diagnosing diabetes, greater than or equal to 200 mg per deciliter. Let's move on to the next question. This nurse-to-nurse -nurse handoff communication question has been asked three times in the last five years, so it is not as common but still important to review. During a shift change, a nurse is giving a verbal report to the oncoming nurse. What essential piece of information should the nurse include to ensure the safety and continuity of care for the client? A. The client's current list of medications. B the client's involuntary admission status. C, the client's food preferences and mealtime routines. D, the presence of family members at the bedside. The correct answer is B, the client's involuntary admission status. B is correct because when handing off care, the nurse must communicate whether the client is under an involuntary admission status as this indicates that the client is legally required to remain in the healthcare facility, often due to mental health concerns that pose a danger to themselves or others. This information ensures that appropriate precautions and legal considerations are maintained. A is incorrect because while medication lists are important, they are usually available in the electronic medical record and do not need to be communicated verbally unless there are significant recent changes. C is incorrect because knowing a client's food preferences can be helpful for daily care, but it is not critical information that affects the safety or legal requirements of the client's care. D is incorrect because the presence of family members is not essential information for a verbal handoff unless there are specific concerns about family involvement in care. Let us move on to the next question. This prioritization question has been asked six times in the last five years, making it moderately likely to appear on the exam. A nurse is reviewing several client situations and must decide which one requires immediate attention. Which client should the nurse prioritize? Option A, 
a patient with a blood glucose level of 250 milligrams per deciliter who is on prednisone for pneumonia. Option B, a patient receiving a continuous heparin infusion with a 50% drop in platelet count over five days. Option C, a patient with type 2 diabetes who reports tingling in their feet. Option D, a patient with post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis who has a urine output of 20 milliliters per hour. The correct answer is option B, a patient receiving continuous heparin infusion with a 50% drop in platelet count over five days. Option B is correct because this patient is exhibiting signs of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, which is a serious condition where the immune system forms antibodies that activate platelets. This causes both a drop in platelet levels and an increased risk of blood clot formation. This is a medical emergency that requires immediate action, such as stopping the heparin infusion and notifying the healthcare provider. Option A is incorrect because elevated blood glucose is a common side effect of corticosteroids, such as prednisone, and it can be managed with insulin or other diabetic medications. While it should be addressed, it is not as urgent as heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Option C is incorrect because tingling in the feet is a sign of peripheral neuropathy, which is a complication of diabetes, but it is a chronic issue that does not require immediate intervention. Option D is incorrect because decreased urine output in a patient with glomerulonephritis indicates kidney involvement, but it is a symptom that requires monitoring rather than immediate intervention unless the output continues to decline. Let us proceed to the next question. This sexually transmitted infection management question has been asked four times in the last five years, making it moderately likely to appear on the exam. A patient has been diagnosed with trichomoniasis, which is a sexually transmitted infection. What is the appropriate next step the nurse should take? Option A, begin a 24-hour urine collection. Option B, implement contact precautions. Option C, obtain an order for metronidazole. Option D, report the infection to the health department. The correct answer is option C, obtain an order for metronidazole. Option C is correct because trichomoniasis is treated with metronidazole, which is an antiprotozole medication. This is the appropriate treatment to address the infection, which is caused by the parasite called Trichomonas vaginalis and is typically spread through sexual contact. Option A is incorrect because a 24-hour urine collection is not indicated for the diagnosis or treatment of trichomoniasis. Option B is incorrect because contact precautions are unnecessary for this infection, as it is not transmitted through casual contact, but rather through sexual intercourse. Option D is incorrect because trichomoniasis is not a reportable infection in most jurisdictions, so notifying the health department is not required. Let us move on to the final question. This pediatric burn management question has been asked five times in the last five years, so it has a good chance of appearing on your exam. A four-year-old child who sustained severe burns to the chest, abdomen, and legs is now experiencing rapid breathing, an elevated pulse, and low oxygen saturation. What is the nurse's initial intervention? Option A, request an order for intravenous fluids. Option B, prepare the child for intubation. Option C, begin burn wound care. Option D, review the child's laboratory results. The correct answer is option B, prepare the child for intubation. Option B is correct because the child is showing signs of respiratory distress with a high respiratory rate, increased pulse, and low oxygen levels. These symptoms suggest a potential airway injury due to inhalation, which can quickly lead to respiratory failure. 
Intubation and securing the airway are the nurse's immediate priorities to prevent further respiratory compromise. Option A is incorrect because while fluid resuscitation is important in managing burn injuries, securing the airway takes precedence due to the child's respiratory distress. Option C is incorrect because wound care is secondary to managing the child's respiratory condition, which poses a more immediate threat to life. Option D is incorrect because laboratory values can provide valuable information, but the primary concern in this scenario is the child's breathing and oxygenation, making airway management the top priority. Let us move to the next question. This bulimia nervosa-related question has been asked five times over the last five years, which means there's a good chance it could appear on your exam. The nurse is caring for a patient diagnosed with bulimia nervosa. Based on the nurse's understanding of treatment options, which medication is most likely to be prescribed? Option A, metformin. Option B, bupropion. Option C, fluoxetine. Option D, clozapine. The correct answer is option C, fluoxetine. Option C is correct. Fluoxetine, which is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, is the only medication specifically approved for the treatment of bulimia nervosa. It has shown effectiveness in reducing the frequency of binge purge episodes and helping manage co-occurring conditions such as anxiety or depression. Option A is incorrect. Metformin is primarily used to control blood sugar levels in individuals with type 2 diabetes. It is not used to treat bulimia nervosa, as this condition focuses on eating behaviors, not blood glucose regulation. Option B is incorrect. Bupropion is contraindicated in individuals with bulimia nervosa due to its association with an increased risk of seizures, especially in individuals with eating disorders. Option D is incorrect. Clozapine is an atypical antipsychotic used to manage schizophrenia and psychosis. It has no indication for bulimia nervosa and is not commonly prescribed for eating disorders. Let us move on to the next question. This hepatitis C-related question has been asked six times in the last five years, so there is a strong possibility it will come up on the exam. A nurse is providing education to a patient who has recently been diagnosed with hepatitis C. What is the most accurate information to include in the teaching? Option A. You should clean your bathroom with bleach after every use. Option B. Avoid preparing food for others while you are infectious. Option C. Many people with hepatitis C may not notice any symptoms. Option D. We will need to vaccinate everyone in your household to protect them. The correct answer is option C. Many people with hepatitis C may not notice any symptoms. Option C is correct. Hepatitis C is often referred to as a silent infection because many individuals remain without symptoms for years. Most patients do not develop symptoms until significant liver damage, such as cirrhosis or liver failure, has occurred. Option A is incorrect. Hepatitis C is not transmitted through casual contact or surfaces like bathrooms. It spreads through blood-to-blood -blood contact, so cleaning with bleach is unnecessary unless there is blood exposure. Option B is incorrect. Hepatitis C is not spread by preparing or handling food. Recommending food restrictions would apply more to hepatitis A, which is transmitted through contaminated food or water. Option D is incorrect. There is no vaccine available for hepatitis C. Educating household members about avoiding blood exposure and promoting regular testing is more important. Let us continue with the next question. This cholecystitis-related question has been asked four times over the last five years, making it moderately likely to appear on the exam. A nurse is conducting an assessment on a patient with suspected acute cholecystitis. Which of the following clinical findings is most likely to be observed? Option A, stools containing blood and mucus. 
Option B. Discomfort while urinating. Option C. Intermittent pain in the upper abdomen. Option D. Decreased bowel sounds. The correct answer is option C. Intermittent pain in the upper abdomen. Option C is correct. Acute cholecystitis commonly presents with intermittent right upper quadrant or epigastric pain that may radiate to the right shoulder. This pain is referred to as biliary colic and is often triggered by fatty meals. Option A is incorrect. Blood and mucus in the stool are more indicative of inflammatory bowel diseases such as Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, not cholecystitis. Option B is incorrect. Discomfort while urinating, known as dysuria, is typically associated with urinary tract infections, not cholecystitis. Option D is incorrect. Decreased bowel sounds are not typically seen in cholecystitis. The primary concern is right upper quadrant pain and tenderness. Let us proceed to the next question. This prostate cancer-related question has been asked seven times over the last five years, making it very likely to appear in the examination. A nurse is leading a health seminar on prostate cancer awareness. Which of the following factors should be highlighted as increasing the risk of prostate cancer? A. Diet rich in red meat and animal fat. B. History of erectile dysfunction. C. Diagnosis of human immunodeficiency virus. D. History of human papilloma virus. The correct answer is option A. Diet rich in red meat and animal fat. Option A is correct. A diet high in red meat and animal fat has been associated with an increased risk of prostate cancer. Other significant risk factors include advancing age and a family history of the disease. Option B is incorrect. Erectile dysfunction is not recognized as a risk factor for prostate cancer. It may signal cardiovascular issues, but does not increase prostate cancer risk. Option C is incorrect. Human immunodeficiency virus is more closely linked with testicular cancer and does not significantly increase the risk of prostate cancer. Option D is incorrect. Human papilloma virus is associated with other cancers, such as cervical and oropharyngeal cancers, but not prostate cancer. Let us move on to the next question. This medication safety-related question has been asked eight times in the past five years, making it highly likely to appear on your examination. Before administering medication to a patient, which of the following steps should the nurse take first to ensure safety? A. Confirm the patient's identity using their full name and date of birth. B. Ask if the patient has any known allergies to medications. C. Check the patient's vital signs to ensure medication appropriateness. D. Review the patient's current medications for any potential drug interactions. The correct answer is option A. Confirm the patient's identity using their full name and date of birth. Option A is correct. The first and most critical step in medication administration is verifying the patient's identity to avoid potentially dangerous medication errors. Using two identifiers, such as full name and date of birth, is standard practice. Option B is incorrect. While checking for allergies is essential before administering medication, it is not the first step. Allergies should be checked after confirming the patient's identity. Option C is incorrect. Checking vital signs is important for medications that affect vital parameters, but verifying the patient's identity takes precedence. Option D is incorrect. Reviewing the patient's medication profile for interactions is necessary, but follows after confirming the correct patient's identity. Let us review the next question. This pregnancy sign-related question has been asked five times in the last five years, so there is a good chance it could show up in your examination. During a staff meeting on pregnancy, the nurse discusses the various signs associated with pregnancy. Which of the following is a definitive or positive? Sign of pregnancy. A. Absence of menstruation. B. Detection of uterine souffle. 
C. A positive result on a pregnancy test. D. Audible fetal heartbeat. The correct answer is option D. Audible fetal heartbeat. Option D is correct. Detecting a fetal heartbeat, typically between 10 and 12 weeks with a Doppler, is considered a positive sign of pregnancy. This sign confirms the presence of a viable fetus. Option A is incorrect. Amenorrhea, which refers to the absence of menstruation, is a presumptive sign of pregnancy and can occur for other reasons, such as stress or hormonal imbalances. Option B is incorrect. Uterine souffle refers to the sound of blood flowing through uterine vessels and can be caused by other conditions, making it a probable rather than a positive sign. Option C is incorrect. A positive pregnancy test is considered a probable sign as it could result from factors unrelated to pregnancy, such as certain medications that increase the levels of human chorionic gonadotropin. Let us proceed to the next question. This neonatal jaundice-related question has been asked six times over the last five years, making it highly probable to appear in the examination. The nurse is caring for a newborn diagnosed with jaundice. If left untreated, what is the most serious potential complication that could arise from neonatal jaundice? A. Severe bacterial infection, also known as sepsis. B. Dangerous drop in body temperature, also known as hypothermia. C. Kern icterus, also known as bilirubin encephalopathy. D. Lung infection, also known as pneumonia. The correct answer is option C. Kern icterus, also known as bilirubin encephalopathy. Option C is correct. Kernicterus is the most serious complication of untreated neonatal jaundice. Excessive bilirubin can cross the blood-brain barrier, leading to permanent neurological damage such as cerebral palsy, hearing loss, and developmental delays. Option A is incorrect. Sepsis is a severe condition in newborns, but it is not a direct result of untreated jaundice. It is a systemic infection unrelated to bilirubin metabolism. Option B is incorrect. Hypothermia is a concern for all newborns, but is not a consequence of jaundice. It occurs due to environmental factors, not from bilirubin buildup. Option D is incorrect. Pneumonia can result from infections or aspiration, but is not caused by untreated jaundice. Let us move to the next question. This assessment-related question has been asked five times in the last five years, which means it is moderately likely to appear in your examination. A nurse needs to assess how a patient responds to painful stimuli located on the periphery of the body. Which method should the nurse use for this assessment? A. Applying pressure to the patient's upper back. B. Performing a sternal rub. C. Compressing the muscle along the side of the neck. D. Applying pressure to the nail bed of the patient's finger. The correct answer is option D. Applying pressure to the nail bed of the patient's finger. Option D is correct. To properly assess the patient's reaction to peripheral pain, it is necessary to target areas on the body's extremities, such as the fingers or toes. Applying pressure on the nail bed is an appropriate way to evaluate the response to peripheral pain stimuli. This technique allows for assessing the integrity of peripheral nerve function without causing significant harm to the patient. Option A is incorrect. Pressing on the upper back does not target peripheral areas and is not effective in evaluating peripheral pain responses. The technique does not provide accurate information about nerve function in the extremities. Option B is incorrect. A sternal rub is generally used to check a patient's level of consciousness rather than for evaluating peripheral pain response. It stimulates central pain receptors, which are not the focus in this type of assessment. Option C is incorrect. Squeezing the sternocleidomastoid muscle located in the neck would not help in assessing peripheral pain response. This muscle is too close to central structures to give a true indication of peripheral pain sensation. Let us move on to the next question. 
This intravenous fluid management question has been asked six times in the last five years and has a high probability of showing up in the examination. When managing a patient on 3% saline as a maintenance intravenous fluid, which nursing intervention should take priority? A. Check serum bicarbonate levels. B. Track sodium levels in the urine. C. Monitor the patient's blood pressure. D. Gather a 24-hour urine collection. The correct answer is option C. Monitor the patient's blood pressure. Option C is correct. Since 3% saline is a hypertonic solution, it increases the osmolality of the extracellular fluid, pulling water out of cells and into the bloodstream. This can result in fluid volume overload, manifesting as elevated blood pressure, pulmonary congestion, and crackles in the lungs. Therefore, the nurse's primary concern should be monitoring for signs of this overload, such as hypertension, pulmonary edema, and shortness of breath. Option A is incorrect. The nurse's focus should be on monitoring sodium levels rather than bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is not a key indicator when evaluating the effects of hypertonic saline. Option B is incorrect. Tracking serum sodium levels is more important than urine sodium levels because the nurse is primarily assessing for the effects of fluid shifts and sodium balance in the blood, not in the urine. Option D is incorrect. While 24-hour urine output can be useful in some cases, it is not the best indicator of immediate changes related to fluid overload. Monitoring the patient's clinical symptoms, particularly blood pressure and lung sounds, is a higher priority. Let us continue to the next question. This medication safety question has been asked seven times in the last five years, so it has a strong chance of appearing on your examination. A nurse is reviewing prescribed medications for several patients. Which of the following orders should the nurse question? A. Captopril for a patient with heart failure. B. Metoprolol for a patient experiencing frequent premature ventricular contractions. C. Verapamil for a patient with an irregular heart rhythm. D. Spironolactone for a patient with advanced kidney failure. The correct answer is option D, spironolactone for a patient with advanced kidney failure. Option D is correct. Spironolactone is a diuretic that spares potassium, meaning it prevents the body from losing potassium in the urine. However, in patients with end-stage renal disease, the kidneys are already struggling to filter out excess potassium, leading to a high risk of hyperkalemia or elevated potassium levels. Administering spironolactone in this situation could lead to dangerously high potassium levels, so the nurse should question this prescription. Option A is incorrect. Captopril is an angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitor that is commonly prescribed for heart failure patients. It helps to lower blood pressure and reduce the strain on the heart, which is beneficial in managing heart failure symptoms. Option B is incorrect. Beta blockers like metoprolol are effective in managing patients with premature ventricular contractions. Premature ventricular contractions are extra heartbeats that can cause palpitations, and metoprolol can help reduce the frequency of these extra beats by lowering the heart rate and improving heart rhythm control. Option C is incorrect. Verapamil is a calcium channel blocker that can be useful in controlling the heart rate in patients with atrial fibrillation, which is a type of irregular heart rhythm. It works by slowing down the conduction of electrical impulses through the heart, helping to maintain a normal heart rate. Let us move on to the next question. This discharge teaching question has been asked nine times in the last five years and is one of the board's favorites, so there is a high probability of it appearing in the exam. A patient is being discharged following knee replacement surgery, what should the nurse emphasize during discharge teaching? A. You will need to use a wheelchair for mobility after surgery. B. Be sure to restart your prescribed anticoagulants. C. It is okay to use a pillow under your knee to reduce pain. D. Ice packs can be applied for up to one hour at a time. 
The correct answer is B. Be sure to restart your prescribed anticoagulants. B is correct. After knee arthroplasty, patients are at an increased risk of developing blood clots due to reduced mobility. The nurse should instruct the patient to resume anticoagulation therapy as prescribed to prevent venous thromboembolism, abbreviated as VTE. Anticoagulant medications are usually recommended for at least two weeks following surgery to reduce the risk of clot formation. A is incorrect. While mobility will be limited after knee replacement surgery, patients are generally encouraged to ambulate using crutches or a walker, not a wheelchair, as early mobilization helps prevent complications like blood clots and improves recovery outcomes. C is incorrect. Placing a pillow directly under the knee can increase the risk of a contracture, where the knee becomes permanently bent, limiting the range of motion. Instead, Patients should keep the knee extended and use pillows to support the entire leg. D is incorrect. While ice can help reduce pain and swelling, it should only be applied for 15 to 20 minutes at a time to avoid skin damage, particularly in the first 24 hours after surgery. Prolonged ice application is not recommended. Let us continue to the next question. This leukemia-related question has been asked six times in the last five years and may reappear in your exam. A nurse is performing an assessment on a patient with leukemia. Which clinical findings would be expected in this patient? A. Shortness of breath, fatigue, and low blood pressure. B. Bruising, tiredness, and bone discomfort. C. Slow heart rate low blood pressure, and palpitations. D, numbness, skin rash, and stomach pain. The correct answer is B, bruising, tiredness, and bone discomfort. B is correct. Leukemia affects the bone marrow's ability to produce healthy red blood cells and platelets, resulting in anemia, causing fatigue, and a tendency to bruise easily due to low platelet levels. The rapid production of abnormal white blood cells also puts pressure on the bones, leading to bone pain, a common symptom in leukemia patients. A is incorrect. Although some patients may experience shortness of breath due to anemia, hypotension and bradycardia are not typically directly associated with leukemia itself, but rather with other conditions or side effects of treatment. C is incorrect. Bradycardia and palpitations are not typical findings in leukemia. These symptoms are more related to cardiovascular issues rather than hematologic disorders. D is incorrect. Numbness, a facial rash, and abdominal pain are not commonly associated with leukemia. The primary skin manifestations of leukemia are more likely to be related to bruising and petechiae caused by the low platelet count. Let us proceed to the next question. This substance use disorder-related question has been asked four times in the last five years. In a class on substance use disorders, the nurse is explaining physical dependence. Which statement accurately describes physical dependence? A. An intense craving for the pleasurable effects of a drug. B. A need to continue taking a drug to prevent withdrawal symptoms. C. The potential for life-threatening consequences due to drug use. D. The unpleasant sensations that arise when a drug is not taken. The correct answer is B. A need to continue taking a drug to prevent withdrawal symptoms. B is correct. Physical dependence occurs when the body has adapted to the presence of a drug, leading to withdrawal symptoms when the drug is stopped. This condition is different from addiction, which is characterized by a compulsive need for the drug, despite harmful consequences. Withdrawal symptoms may vary depending on the substance, but typically include physical and emotional discomfort. A is incorrect. This statement refers to psychological dependence, where the user has a strong desire to experience the drug's effects, particularly the feelings of euphoria or pleasure. 
This is distinct from physical dependence, which involves the body's need for the drug to function normally. C is incorrect. While physical dependence can lead to withdrawal, which in some cases may have severe effects, such as with alcohol or benzodiazepines, this option describes the potential consequences of substance misuse, not the definition of physical dependence itself. D is incorrect. This option only describes one aspect of physical dependence. The key defining characteristic of physical dependence is the necessity to continue taking the drug to avoid these withdrawal symptoms. Let us move on to the next question. This stroke-related question has been asked eight times in the last five years and has a high chance of reappearing in the exam. A patient presents to the emergency department with sudden weakness on one side of the body and difficulty speaking. The nurse suspects a stroke. Which additional finding would further confirm this suspicion? A. Irregular heartbeat. B. Dizziness upon standing. C. Unequal pupil size. D. Low blood sugar levels. The correct answer is C. Unequal pupil size. C is correct. Anisocoria, or unequal pupil sizes, may be a sign of increased intracranial pressure or damage to the brainstem, both of which can occur during a stroke. This neurological finding is an important indicator that supports the diagnosis of a stroke and necessitates urgent medical intervention. A is incorrect. While certain types of strokes, particularly embolic strokes, can be linked to cardiac arrhythmias, such as atrial fibrillation, an irregular heartbeat alone does not confirm the diagnosis of a stroke. B is incorrect. Orthostatic hypotension, characterized by a drop in blood pressure when standing, is not a typical symptom of a stroke. While hypotension may develop in stroke patients, it is not one of the primary signs in acute stroke presentation. D is incorrect. Hypoglycemia can mimic stroke symptoms, but the presence of low blood sugar would not support the diagnosis of a stroke. Checking blood glucose levels is important to rule out other causes of neurological symptoms, but it does not confirm a stroke. Let us review the next question. This immunization-related question has been asked seven times in the last five years and has a moderate chance of being included in your exam. A nurse is reviewing information on immunizations during a continuing education session. Which statement by the nurse reflects accurate understanding? A. The MMR vaccine is an example of a live attenuated vaccine. B. Certain vaccines can be mixed together in a single syringe. C. It is safe to give an intramuscular vaccine in the dorsogluteal muscle. D. There must be a two-week interval between different vaccinations. The correct answer is A. The MMR vaccine is an example of a live attenuated vaccine. A is correct. The measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, abbreviated as MMR, contains live but weakened, also known as attenuated, virus particles that stimulate an immune response without causing the disease. Live attenuated vaccines generally offer long-lasting immunity with one or two doses, and other examples include the varicella and rotavirus vaccines. B is incorrect. Vaccines should not be mixed in the same syringe unless specifically recommended by the manufacturer. Administering vaccines separately ensures that each dose is delivered properly and reduces the risk of adverse reactions from combining ingredients. C is incorrect. The dorsogluteal site is not recommended for intramuscular injections due to the risk of damaging the sciatic nerve. The preferred intramuscular injection sites for adults are the deltoid muscle in the arm and the vastus lateralis muscle in the thigh. D is incorrect. Most vaccines can be given at the same time without requiring a waiting period. The two-week interval recommendation applies to certain vaccines when they are not administered simultaneously, but it is not a universal rule for all vaccines. Let us move to the next question. 
This pre-procedure instructions question has been asked seven times in the last five years, and it is a favorite of the board, making it very likely to appear again. A nurse is reviewing pre-procedure instructions with a patient scheduled for an intravenous urography. Which of the following patient statements shows they correctly understand the preparation for the procedure? A. I will have a urinary catheter placed during the test to help drain my bladder. B. I will take a laxative the night before to make sure my bowels are clear for the test. C. I will need to drink a lot of water before the test to fill my bladder. D. I might see blood in my urine for a few days after the procedure. The correct answer is B. I will take a laxative the night before to make sure my bowels are clear for the test. B is correct. This response is appropriate because bowel preparation is essential for this type of test. An intravenous urography is an imaging test that visualizes the kidneys, ureters, and bladder. If the bowels are not cleared, stool in the intestines can obstruct the radiologist's view of the urinary tract, leading to less accurate imaging results. A laxative taken the night before will ensure that the intestines are clear for the examination. A is incorrect. A urinary catheter is not used for this diagnostic test. Instead, the patient is typically instructed to empty their bladder before the procedure to ensure the imaging contrast medium can be seen clearly as it moves through the urinary system. A catheter is not part of the standard procedure unless there are specific urinary retention concerns. C is incorrect. The patient should not fill their bladder with water prior to the test. In fact, the opposite is true. The bladder should be empty before starting the urography. Filling the bladder with water could lead to inaccurate imaging results. D is incorrect. Blood in the urine is not expected after intravenous urography. If a patient experiences blood in their urine following the procedure, it could be indicative of complications and should be reported to the healthcare provider immediately. Let us continue with the next question. This legal consent question has been asked five times in the last five years and has a high probability of reappearing on the exam. A nurse is preparing to transport a 12-year-old client scheduled for an appendectomy to the operating room. The child's mother has signed the surgical consent form, but the father, who just arrived at the hospital, also shares joint legal custody. What is the most appropriate action for the nurse to take? A. Ask the father to sign an additional consent form before proceeding. B. Delay the surgery until the father also provides consent. C. Continue with the surgery as planned, based on the mother's signed consent. D. Notify the surgeon about the father's arrival and discuss how to proceed. The correct answer is C. Continue with the surgery as planned, based on the mother's signed consent. C is correct. The mother's consent is legally sufficient to proceed with the surgery since both parents share joint legal custody. In situations where one parent with legal custody has already provided consent, additional consent from the other parent is not required unless otherwise specified by hospital policy. Delaying the surgery to seek further consent could potentially harm the child, especially in the case of an emergency procedure like an appendectomy. A is incorrect. Asking the father to sign another consent form is not necessary when one parent with legal custody has already provided consent. Requiring additional consent would delay the surgery unnecessarily. B is incorrect. Postponing the surgery could endanger the child's health. Appendicitis can progress quickly, and delaying surgery could result in complications such as a ruptured appendix, which would increase the child's risk of infection and other serious health issues. D is incorrect. While it is generally a good practice to keep, the surgeon informed, notifying the surgeon about the father's presence is not required for the issue of consent when the mother has already provided the necessary approval for the surgery. Let us move to the next question. 
This adrenalectomy surgery question has been asked four times in the last five years, making it moderately likely to appear on the exam. A patient is recovering from bilateral adrenalectomy surgery. Which medication should the nurse anticipate will be prescribed postoperatively? A. A proton pump inhibitor like pantoprazole. B. An antithyroid medication like propylthioracil. C. A beta blocker like propranolol. D. A corticosteroid like hydrocortisone. The correct answer is D. A corticosteroid like hydrocortisone. D is correct. After the removal of both adrenal glands, bilateral adrenalectomy, the patient will no longer be able to produce essential hormones such as cortisol. Cortisol is critical for managing stress, regulating blood sugar, controlling inflammation, and maintaining fluid balance. Without proper replacement therapy, the patient could enter adrenal crisis, characterized by symptoms like low blood pressure, lethargy, and low blood sugar. Therefore, hydrocortisone or another corticosteroid must be administered to compensate for the lack of naturally produced cortisol and to prevent life-threatening complications. A is incorrect. Although pantoprazole is used to reduce the risk of stress ulcers in patients who have undergone major surgery, it is not directly related to the management of adrenal insufficiency, which is the primary concern following adrenalectomy. B is incorrect. Propylthioracil is used to treat hyperthyroidism and thyroid storm. It reduces the production of thyroid hormones, but has no role in managing cortisol deficiency after adrenal gland removal. C is incorrect. Propranolol is a beta blocker used to manage symptoms like fast heart rate and high blood pressure in various conditions, such as hyperthyroidism. However, it is not relevant to the management of adrenal insufficiency following an adrenalectomy. Let us review the next question. This Wernicke's aphasia question has been asked six times in the last five years and is highly likely to appear on the exam. A nurse is assessing a client with Wernicke's aphasia. Which characteristic would be most consistent with this diagnosis? A. Difficulty performing coordinated movements despite intact motor function. B. Complete inability to produce any words. C. Difficulty swallowing liquids or food. D. Speech that is fluent but lacks meaning or coherence. The correct answer is D. Speech that is fluent but lacks meaning or coherence. D is correct. Wernicke's aphasia is a language disorder, typically caused by damage to the left temporal lobe, specifically in the Wernicke area of the brain. Patients with this condition can speak fluently with normal rhythm and grammar, but their speech may not make sense, often referred to as word salad. They may use incorrect or unrelated words and have difficulty understanding spoken or written language. Despite their speech fluency, the content lacks meaning, making it difficult for them to communicate effectively. A is incorrect. The inability to perform skilled movements, despite having normal strength and motor function, is known as apraxia, not aphasia. Apraxia is a motor planning disorder and is unrelated to language comprehension or production. B is incorrect. Mutism, or the complete inability to produce any speech, is not a characteristic of Wernicke's aphasia. This may occur in severe cases of Broca's aphasia, where speech production is impaired, but comprehension is intact. C is incorrect. Difficulty swallowing or dysphagia affects the ability to eat or drink safely. While it may occur in neurological conditions like stroke, it is unrelated to aphasia, which affects language processing rather than motor control of the mouth and throat. Let us move on to the next question. This cortisol-related condition question has been asked five times in the last five years and is likely to appear again on the exam. A nurse is educating a newly graduated nurse about conditions that result in elevated cortisol levels. Which condition is associated with increased cortisol production? A. 
Addison's disease. B. Congestive heart failure. C. Chronic kidney disease. D. Cushing's syndrome. The correct answer is D. Cushing's syndrome. D is correct. Cushing's syndrome is characterized by excessive production of cortisol, often due to long-term use of corticosteroid medications, or, less commonly, a tumor in the pituitary or adrenal glands. Cortisol is a hormone produced by the adrenal cortex and plays a significant role in managing stress, regulating blood pressure, and controlling the body's metabolism of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. In Cushing's syndrome, high cortisol levels lead to symptoms such as weight gain, high blood sugar, thinning skin, and high blood pressure. A is incorrect. Addison's disease results in adrenal insufficiency, meaning that the body produces insufficient cortisol, the opposite of Cushing's syndrome. Patients with Addison's disease often experience fatigue, weight loss, low blood pressure, and electrolyte imbalances due to the lack of cortisol. B is incorrect. While congestive heart failure affects the heart's ability to pump blood efficiently, it does not cause significant alterations in cortisol levels. The condition is primarily related to fluid overload and impaired cardiac function. C is incorrect. Chronic kidney disease involves the gradual loss of kidney function, affecting the body's ability to filter waste from the blood. While it may cause changes in fluid and electrolyte balance, it does not directly affect cortisol production. Let us move to the next question. This bloodstream infection risk question has been asked seven times in the last five years, making it highly likely to appear again in the exam. A nurse is caring for several patients receiving intravenous infusions. Which of the following clients is at the greatest risk of developing a bloodstream infection? A. A patient with a midline catheter in the left arm. B. A patient with a peripherally inserted central catheter in the upper arm. C. A patient with a subcutaneously implanted port in the chest. D. A patient with a non-tunneled central line in the internal jugular vein. The correct answer is D. A patient with a non-tunneled central line in the internal jugular vein. D is correct. Non-tunneled central lines, especially those placed in the internal jugular vein, are associated with a higher risk of bloodstream infections compared to other types of venous access devices. These lines are often used for short-term access in critically ill patients, and because they are inserted in high microbial areas like the neck, there is an increased chance of infection. The lack of tunneling means the catheter has a more direct route to the bloodstream, bypassing some of the body's natural defense mechanisms, making infection more likely. A is incorrect. Midline catheters inserted in the arm have a lower risk of infection compared to central lines because they do not terminate in large central veins. These are usually used for medium-term treatments and have fewer infection-related complications. B is incorrect. Peripherally inserted central catheters are inserted peripherally but extend into central veins. While there is a risk of infection, it is generally lower than with non-tunneled central lines, especially when proper maintenance protocols are followed. C is incorrect. Implanted ports are surgically placed under the skin and have the lowest infection risk among long-term central venous access devices because they are fully enclosed, minimizing exposure to external bacteria. Let us review the next question. This osteoarthritis treatment question has been asked six times in the last five years, and it is important to study for the exam. A client is being treated for osteoarthritis, which medication would the nurse most likely expect to be prescribed to help manage the client's pain and inflammation? A. Allopurinol B. Etinercept C. Oxaprozin D. Methotrexate The correct answer is C. Oxaprozin C is correct. 
Oxaprozin is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug commonly used to treat the pain and inflammation associated with osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis involves the gradual breakdown of cartilage within joints, leading to pain, stiffness, and decreased mobility. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like oxaprozin help manage these symptoms by reducing inflammation, providing pain relief, and improving joint function. However, long-term use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can increase the risk of gastrointestinal ulcers and kidney dysfunction, so monitoring is necessary. A is incorrect. Allopurinol is used to treat gout, a type of arthritis caused by excess uric acid in the blood, which forms crystals in the joints. It is not indicated for osteoarthritis, which is a degenerative joint disease. B is incorrect. Etanercept is a biologic agent used to treat autoimmune conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis. It works by inhibiting tumor necrosis factor, a substance involved in inflammation. Osteoarthritis, however, is not an autoimmune disorder, so biologics are not typically prescribed. D is incorrect. Methotrexate is an immunosuppressant commonly used to treat rheumatoid arthritis. It helps to reduce inflammation in autoimmune diseases by inhibiting the immune system. Methotrexate is not indicated for osteoarthritis, which is not driven by an immune response. Let us move to the next question. This physiological anemia of pregnancy question has been asked five times over the last five years, making it likely to appear on the exam. A nurse is caring for a pregnant client who was found to have a lower concentration of red blood cells compared to before pregnancy. What is the underlying reason for this condition, often referred to as physiological anemia of pregnancy? Option A. Reduced production of red blood cells. Option B. Increased plasma volume. Option C. Heightened demand for iron in the body. Option D. A decrease in the size of the heart. The correct answer is option B. Increased plasma volume. Option B is correct. During pregnancy, there is an increase in plasma volume, which causes the relative dilution of red blood cells. Although the absolute number of red blood cells increases, the plasma volume rises at a faster rate, resulting in what is called physiological anemia of pregnancy. Option A is incorrect. There is no significant reduction in red blood cell production during pregnancy. In fact, the production increases, but it is outpaced by the plasma volume, making it a dilutional anemia rather than one caused by a decrease in red blood cell production. Option C is incorrect. Although the body's need for iron increases during pregnancy, this is not the primary cause of physiological anemia. The anemia is mainly due to increased plasma volume. Option D is incorrect. The heart typically enlarges during pregnancy to handle the increased blood volume, so a decrease in heart size does not explain physiological anemia. Let us move on to the next question. This concussion-related discharge instructions question has been asked six times in the past five years, so there is a strong chance it will show up on the exam. The nurse is giving discharge instructions to the parents of a 17-year-old patient who has sustained a moderate concussion. Which of the following statements by the parents shows that they have understood the nurse's guidance? Option A. We should wake him up every two hours to check his condition. Option B. He should wear extra padding in his helmet for tomorrow's football practice. Option C. He should avoid driving until after his follow-up appointment. Option D. It is important to keep him active and prevent naps during the day. The correct answer is option C. He should avoid driving until after his follow-up appointment. Option C is correct. After a moderate concussion, activities like driving should be avoided due to the cognitive impairments that can result from a concussion. Rest and follow-up with a physician are necessary before resuming such activities. Option A is incorrect. 
Waking the patient every two hours is outdated advice and may disrupt the necessary rest for recovery unless there are signs of worsening neurological status. Option B is incorrect. The patient should not return to physical activities like football until cleared by a healthcare professional. Extra padding will not protect the brain adequately after a concussion. Option D is incorrect. Encouraging rest, including naps, is essential during concussion recovery. Overexertion can worsen symptoms and prolong recovery. Let us continue with the next question. This developmental milestone delay question has been asked four times in the last five years, making it moderately likely to appear in your exam. A nurse is caring for a hospitalized one-year-old patient. What developmental milestone may be delayed due to the child's hospital stay? Option A, learning to walk. Option B, starting to run. Option C, sitting up independently. Option D, crawling on hands and knees. The correct answer is option A, learning to walk. Option A is correct. One-year-olds are typically on the verge of learning to walk. Hospitalization can limit their movement, delaying this milestone. Option B is incorrect. Running usually occurs later, around 18 to 24 months, so hospitalization at one year is unlikely to impact this skill. Option C is incorrect. Sitting up independently is usually achieved earlier, around six to eight months of age, so it would not be delayed by hospitalization at one year. Option D is incorrect. Crawling generally occurs between six to 10 months of age, so a one-year-old would likely have already achieved this milestone. Let us proceed to the next question. This lab test and medication combination question has been asked seven times in the last five years, making it a high priority question for the exam. The nurse reviews several clients' lab tests and prescriptions. Which of the following combinations of a lab test and medication should the nurse question? Option A, liver function tests for a patient prescribed atorvastatin. Option B, international normalized ratio, INR4, a patient prescribed rivaroxaban. Option C, Serum creatinine for a patient prescribed lisinopril. Option D, hemoglobin, A1C for a patient prescribed olanzapine. The correct answer is option B, international normalized ratio, INR, for a patient prescribed rivaroxaban. Option B is correct. Rivaroxaban does not require regular international normalized ratio monitoring, unlike warfarin. International normalized ratio is not a reliable or necessary test for assessing rivaroxaban therapy. Option A is incorrect. Monitoring liver function is appropriate for patients on atorvastatin as it can affect liver enzymes. Option C is incorrect. Serum creatinine monitoring is essential for patients on lisinopril due to its impact on kidney function. Option D is incorrect. Hemoglobin A1C is appropriate for patients on olanzapine as it helps monitor for potential increases in blood sugar levels. Let us move on to the next question. This dopamine infusion question has been asked six times over the last five years, meaning there is a good chance you will encounter it in the exam. The nurse is administering a dopamine infusion to a client. What is the primary therapeutic effect the nurse expects from this medication? Option A, expansion of peripheral blood vessels. Option B, reduction in myocardial oxygen consumption. Option C, promotion of fluid retention. Option D, improvement in cardiac output. The correct answer is option D, improvement in cardiac output. Option D is correct. Dopamine increases cardiac output by enhancing the heart's contractility and stroke volume, which is vital in treating patients with shock or hypotension. Option A is incorrect. Dopamine typically leads to vasoconstriction at higher doses rather than expansion of peripheral blood vessels. Option B is incorrect. Dopamine improves cardiac output but does not specifically reduce myocardial oxygen consumption. 
Option C is incorrect. Dopamine does not promote fluid retention. Its primary role is in improving heart function and blood pressure. Let us continue with the next question. This vital signs question for a one-year-old patient has been asked five times in the last five years, making it likely to appear in the exam. The nurse is taking the vital signs of a one-year-old patient. Which of the following findings would be considered abnormal for a child of this age? Option A, respiratory rate of 30 breaths per minute. Option B, axillary temperature of 99.0 degrees Fahrenheit. Option C, blood pressure of 126 over 90 millimeters of mercury. Option D, heart rate of 120 beats per minute. The correct answer is option C, blood pressure of 126 over 90 millimeters of mercury. Option C is correct. A blood pressure reading of 126 over 90 millimeters of mercury is abnormally high for a one-year-old child. The expected range is much lower, around 90 over 56 millimeters of mercury, and such a high reading could indicate underlying health problems. Option A is incorrect. A respiratory rate of 30 breaths per minute is within the normal range for a one-year-old, which is typically between 20 and 40 breaths per minute. Option B is incorrect. An axillary temperature of 99.0 degrees Fahrenheit is normal for a one-year-old. Option D is incorrect. A heart rate of 120 beats per minute is normal for a child of this age, as infants have higher heart rates than adults. Let us proceed to the next question. This toxic shock syndrome, TSS, risk factor question, has been asked four times in the last five years making it moderately likely to show up on the exam. A nurse is educating a group of women on toxic shock syndrome, TSS, and its risk factors. Which of the following women would not be at increased risk for toxic shock syndrome? Option A, a teenager using highly absorbent tampons. Option B, a woman using a cervical cap as contraception. Option C, a woman using a diaphragm for birth control. Option D, a woman using oral contraceptive pills. The correct answer is option D, a woman using oral contraceptive pills. Option D is correct. Oral contraceptives do not increase the risk of toxic shock syndrome, TSS. As TSS is associated with devices like tampons, diaphragms, and cervical caps that can introduce bacteria, Option A is incorrect. Highly absorbent tampons are a known risk factor for TSS, and women are advised to change tampons frequently to reduce this risk. Option B is incorrect. A cervical cap can increase the risk of TSS if left in place for too long or not properly cleaned. Option C is incorrect. Diaphragm use, like cervical caps, can also increase the risk of TSS when left in place for extended periods. This gastrointestinal conditions question has been asked three times in the past five years, making it less common but still important for the exam. A nurse is teaching a group of student nurses about gastrointestinal conditions. Which of the following conditions is likely to cause hyperactive bowel sounds? A. Paralytic ileus. B. Gastroenteritis. C. Complete bowel obstruction. D. Severe peritonitis. The correct answer is B. Gastroenteritis. B is correct. Gastroenteritis causes hyperactive bowel sounds due to increased peristalsis from the irritation and inflammation of the intestines. A is incorrect. Paralytic ileus results in hypoactive or absent bowel sounds due to the lack of intestinal movement. C is incorrect. A complete bowel obstruction can cause hyperactive sounds initially, but as the obstruction worsens, bowel sounds typically diminish. D is incorrect. Severe peritonitis leads to hypoactive bowel sounds due to the inhibition of peristalsis caused by inflammation. This labor-related question has been asked six times in the last five years, 
which means it is likely to appear in your exam. This question is a common favorite of the board, so it is essential to review it carefully. A laboring client in the second stage shows signs of fetal distress, with the fetal heart monitor indicating late decelerations. What is the nurse's priority intervention? A. Call the physician to report the decelerations. B. Guide the client to practice deep, slow breathing. C. Shift the client into a left side lying position immediately. D. Request an order for intravenous fluids with an isotonic solution. The correct answer is C. Shift the client into a left side lying position immediately. C is correct. Late decelerations often result from inadequate oxygenation and blood flow to the fetus, which can be caused by maternal hypotension or compression of the inferior vena cava. Repositioning the mother to the left lateral position is the most immediate and effective way to improve placental perfusion, as it alleviates pressure on the vena cava and increases blood flow to the placenta. A is incorrect. Although notifying the physician is important, the nurse should attempt to resolve the issue with non-invasive interventions first, such as repositioning the client, before escalating care. B is incorrect. While promoting slow breathing may help with maternal comfort and anxiety, it does not directly address the underlying cause of late decelerations. D is incorrect. Administering fluids may help improve maternal blood pressure and perfusion, but this step comes after attempting to increase blood flow by repositioning. This bowel assessment question has been asked four times over the last five years, so there is a moderate chance it will appear in the exam. An 83-year-old client who was admitted after a fall has not had a bowel movement in five days. Upon assessment, the nurse suspects fecal impaction. Which clinical finding best supports this diagnosis? A. The abdomen feels hard and rigid, like a board. B. The client reports no longer feeling the urge to have a bowel movement. C. The client passes small amounts of watery stool. D. The client complains of abdominal pain, but shows no sign of bloating. The correct answer is C. The client passes small amounts of watery stool. C is correct. Watery or mucus-like stool leakage, often called overflow diarrhea, is a hallmark sign of fecal impaction. When a large, hardened mass of stool obstructs the bowel, softer, liquid stool can bypass the impaction and be expelled. A is incorrect. A rigid, board-like abdomen is more commonly associated with conditions like perforated ulcers or severe peritonitis, not fecal impaction. B is incorrect. Clients with fecal impaction usually experience a strong urge to defecate due to the buildup of stool in the colon or rectum. D is incorrect. While abdominal pain may occur with impaction, it is often accompanied by noticeable distension and swelling. This total parenteral nutrition-related question has been asked five times in the last five years, indicating it could be repeated in the exam. A malnourished client recently started Total Parenteral Nutrition, TPN. Which lab result indicates that the client is responding well to the total parenteral nutrition? A. Fasting blood glucose of 129 mg per deciliter. B. White blood cell count of 12,000 per cubic millimeter. C. Serum albumin level of 3.6 grams per deciliter. D. Urine specific gravity of 1.040. The correct answer is C. Serum albumin level of 3.6 grams per deciliter. C is correct. Albumin reflects overall nutritional health, and a level within the normal range of 3.5 to 5 grams per deciliter suggests that the client is responding well to total parenteral nutrition therapy. A level of 3.6 grams per deciliter indicates recovery from malnutrition. A is incorrect. Elevated glucose levels can occur with total parenteral nutrition, but this is not a marker of successful nutrition. 
Blood glucose should be carefully monitored, but it does not indicate nutritional improvement. B is incorrect. A white blood cell count of 12,000 per cubic millimeter is elevated and suggests an infection, not a sign of nutritional recovery. D is incorrect. A urine-specific gravity of 1.040 suggests dehydration, not effective nutrition from total parenteral nutrition. This cardiopulmonary resuscitation-related question has been asked seven times over the last five years, making it a high-probability topic for the exam. While observing a graduate nurse performing cardiopulmonary resuscitation on an adult client in cardiac arrest, the precepting nurse notices a critical mistake that needs to be addressed immediately. What is the most urgent error requiring correction? A. Checking for a pulse by feeling the carotid artery. B. Ensuring the chest fully recoils between compressions. C. Compressing the chest to a depth of two inches. D. Delaying the request for an automated external defibrillator until after one cycle of cardiopulmonary resuscitation. The correct answer is D. Delaying the request for an automated external defibrillator until after one cycle of cardiopulmonary resuscitation. D is correct. An automated external defibrillator should be obtained as soon as possible, not after one cycle of cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Early defibrillation is critical for survival in cases of ventricular fibrillation or pulseless ventricular tachycardia. A is incorrect. Palpating the carotid artery is appropriate for pulse assessment in adults and does not need correction. B is incorrect. Ensuring full chest recoil is correct, as it helps the heart refill with blood and maintains adequate circulation. C is incorrect. A compression depth of two inches is correct for adults to ensure effective perfusion. This heart failure medication question has been asked eight times, making it one of the more frequently asked questions on the exam. A client with systolic heart failure has been prescribed Carvedilol, which outcome would show that the medication is working effectively? A. Increase in urinary output. B. Improvement in left ventricular ejection fraction. C. Evidence of increased left ventricular remodeling. D. Rise in brain natriuretic peptide levels. The correct answer is B. Improvement in left ventricular ejection fraction. B is correct. Carvedilol, a beta blocker, improves heart function by decreasing the heart rate and enhancing cardiac efficiency, leading to improved left ventricular ejection fraction. A is incorrect. While improved cardiac function can enhance urine output, this is not the primary way to assess Carvedilol's effectiveness. C is incorrect. Increased left ventricular remodeling is a sign of worsening heart failure, not improvement. D is incorrect. A rise in brain natriuretic peptide indicates worsening heart failure, not an improvement. This insulin timing question has been asked six times over the last five years, which means it is a common board favorite. A nurse is instructing a client who has been prescribed aspart insulin, when should the client administer this insulin in relation to mealtime? A. 30 to 45 minutes before eating. B. One hour after finishing a meal. C. 20 to 30 minutes before starting to eat. D. Right before or during the meal, within 5 to 10 minutes. The correct answer is D. Right before or during the meal, within 5 to 10 minutes. D is correct. Aspart insulin is rapid-acting and should be administered right before or during the meal to prevent postprandial hyperglycemia. A is incorrect. Administering aspart insulin 30 to 45 minutes before eating could lead to hypoglycemia before the food is digested. B is incorrect. Administering insulin an hour after a meal does not prevent post-meal blood sugar spikes. C is incorrect. This timing is suitable for regular insulin, not rapid-acting insulin like aspart. 
This fluid balance assessment question has been asked nine times, making it highly likely to appear in the exam. A client with chronic kidney disease and congestive heart failure is being admitted. Which assessment method is the best indicator of the client's current fluid balance? A. Tracking daily body weight. B. Monitoring intake and output. C. Measuring urine-specific gravity. D. Checking serum sodium levels. The correct answer is A. Tracking daily body weight. A is correct. Daily body weight is the most reliable method for assessing fluid balance. A gain or loss of one kilogram corresponds to approximately one liter of fluid, making it the most accurate way to track fluid retention or loss. B is incorrect. Intake and output measurements can be prone to errors and may not reflect all fluid retention. C is incorrect. Urine-specific gravity provides information about kidney concentration ability, but is not a direct measure of overall fluid balance. D is incorrect. Serum sodium levels do not provide a sensitive or specific assessment of daily fluid balance changes. Let us move to the next question. This question has been asked six times in the last five years, making it likely to appear in the exam. A nurse is evaluating a two-year-old who presents with notable symptoms, constant drooling, audible strider, difficulty swallowing, and challenges in speaking. Which condition does the nurse likely suspect based on these observations? Option A, croup. Option B, acute epiglottitis. Option C, laryngotracheitis. Option D, bronchiolitis. The correct answer is option B, acute epiglottitis. Option B is correct because epiglottitis is a severe and potentially life-threatening condition characterized by drooling, dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, dysphonia, difficulty speaking, and respiratory distress. The presence of strader, difficulty speaking, and difficulty swallowing in this child suggests that the epiglottis may be inflamed and swollen, obstructing the airway. Immediate medical intervention is necessary to prevent complete airway obstruction. Option A is incorrect because croup typically presents with a barking cough, not drooling or difficulty swallowing. While it can cause strider, the characteristic cough differentiates it from epiglottitis. Option C is incorrect because laryngotracheitis, which is a form of croup, also causes a barking cough without the severe symptoms of drooling and difficulty swallowing seen in epiglottitis. Option D is incorrect because bronchiolitis affects the lower airways and is usually associated with wheezing, a runny nose, fever, and coughing. It does not cause upper airway obstruction or strider. Let us move on to the next question. This obstructive sleep apnea question has been asked five times over the last five years, so there is a fair chance it will appear in the exam. A patient diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea is discussing treatment strategies with the nurse. Which statement from the patient shows a clear understanding of the education provided? Option A. Using an antiseptic mouthwash before bed will help my condition. Option B. I plan to exercise for at least 150 minutes each week. Option C. I have been researching whether I will need oxygen therapy while I sleep. Option D. I will lie flat when sleeping to reduce symptoms. The correct answer is option B. I plan to exercise for at least 150 minutes each week. Option B is correct because regular exercise is essential in managing obstructive sleep apnea, especially for individuals who are overweight or obese. Weight loss can help reduce airway obstruction caused by excess fat around the neck, and 150 minutes of weekly exercise can help improve overall health and obstructive sleep apnea symptoms. Option A is incorrect because antiseptic mouthwash does not help with obstructive sleep apnea, which involves mechanical obstruction of the airway. Option C is incorrect 
because oxygen therapy is not a first-line treatment for obstructive sleep apnea. Continuous positive airway pressure therapy is more effective in keeping the airway open during sleep. Option D is incorrect because lying flat can worsen obstructive sleep apnea symptoms by promoting airway collapse. Sleeping on the side is typically recommended to keep the airway open. Let us move to the next question. This medication-related question has been asked four times in the last five years and has a moderate chance of appearing in the exam. A nurse is preparing to administer a medication that was recently prescribed to a patient, rivaroxaban. What condition is this drug most commonly prescribed for? Option A, pulmonary hypertension. Option B, venous thromboembolism. Option C, congestive heart failure. Option D, hyperlipidemia. The correct answer is option B, venous thromboembolism. Option B is correct because rivaroxaban is an anticoagulant used to prevent and treat venous thromboembolism, including deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. It inhibits factor 10A, an essential component in the clotting cascade. Option A is incorrect because pulmonary hypertension involves elevated pressure in the lung's arteries and is treated with vasodilators, not anticoagulants. Option C is incorrect because while anticoagulants may be used in patients with atrial fibrillation, rivaroxaban is not used to directly treat congestive heart failure. Option D is incorrect because hyperlipidemia is treated with lipid-lowering drugs such as statins, not anticoagulants like rivaroxaban. Let us move to the next question. This epiglottitis-related question has been asked five times in the last five years, making it a common exam question. A nurse is assessing a three-year-old with suspected epiglottitis. The child has a high fever, drooling, and appears apprehensive. Which of the following actions should the nurse avoid? Option A, listening to the child's breath sounds. Option B, checking the child's vital signs. Option C, weighing the child for medication dosing. Option D, using a tongue depressor to inspect the throat. The correct answer is option D, using a tongue depressor to inspect the throat. Option D is correct because inserting a tongue depressor in the mouth of a child with suspected epiglottitis can trigger sudden airway obstruction due to inflammation of the epiglottis. Immediate medical intervention is required to secure the airway. Options A, B, and C are incorrect because these actions, listening to breath sounds, checking vital signs, and weighing for medication dosing, are necessary for assessment and do not pose a risk of exacerbating the child's condition. Let us move to the next question. This postpartum prioritization question has been asked seven times in the last five years, making it a highly likely question for the exam. A nurse has just received a shift report in a postpartum unit. Which client should the nurse prioritize for immediate assessment? Option A a client experiencing pain while urinating. Option B, a client who required multiple pad changes during the night. Option C, a client who does not want her newborn to stay in the room with her. Option D, a client frustrated with breastfeeding difficulties. The correct answer is option B, a client who required multiple pad changes during the night. Option B is correct because the client who has soaked multiple perineal pads overnight could be experiencing postpartum hemorrhage, a life-threatening condition that requires immediate intervention. The nurse should assess for uterine atony and monitor the client for signs of shock. Option A is incorrect because pain during urination is likely due to an episiotomy or perineal tear and is not life-threatening. Postpartum hemorrhage takes priority. Option C is incorrect because while refusal to have the newborn in the room raises concerns about postpartum depression, the possibility of postpartum hemorrhage must be addressed first. 
Option D is incorrect because breastfeeding difficulties, while important, do not take priority over potential postpartum hemorrhage. Let us move to the next question. This blood transfusion-related question has been asked six times over the last five years, indicating it is a frequent question in the exam. The nurse is preparing to administer packed red blood cells to a patient. What intravenous fluid should be used in conjunction with the blood transfusion? Option A, lactated ringers. Option B, normal saline, 0.9% saline. Option C, half normal saline, 0.45% saline. Option D, hypertonic saline, 3% saline. The correct answer is option B, normal saline, 0.9% saline. Option B is correct because normal saline is the only intravenous fluid that should be used with blood transfusions because it is isotonic and will not cause hemolysis or clotting of the red blood cells. Options A, C, and D are incorrect because lactated ringers contains calcium, which can promote clotting. Half normal saline can cause hemolysis and hypertonic saline can lead to fluid shifts, making them inappropriate for use with blood transfusions. Let us proceed to the next question. This labor monitoring question has been asked five times in the last five years and is likely to appear in the exam. A nurse is monitoring a patient in labor who is showing signs of early decelerations on the fetal heart monitor. What action should the nurse take? Option A, reposition the patient onto her side. Option B, document the early decelerations in the chart. Option C, stop the oxytocin infusion immediately. Option D, prepare for an amnio infusion. The correct answer is option B, document the early decelerations in the chart. Option B is correct because early decelerations are benign and caused by fetal head compression during contractions. They do not indicate fetal distress and only require documentation. Option A is incorrect because repositioning is necessary for variable or late decelerations, but not for early decelerations. Option C is incorrect because there is no need to stop oxytocin as early decelerations do not indicate uterine hyperstimulation or fetal distress. Option D is incorrect because amnioinfusion is reserved for variable decelerations caused by cord compression. Let us move on to the final question. This Raynaud's disease-related question has been asked four times in the last five years, so it may appear in the exam. A patient with Raynaud's disease has been prescribed ephedrine, what should the nurse do next? Option A, provide dietary guidance to the patient. Option B, discuss the prescription with the prescribing physician. Option C, educate the patient about potential side effects. Option D, administer the first dose of ephedrine. The correct answer is option B, discuss the prescription with the prescribing physician. Option B is correct because ephedrine causes vasoconstriction, which can worsen Raynaud's disease by increasing episodes of vasospasm. The nurse should question the prescription with the physician before proceeding. Option A is incorrect because while dietary guidance is important, it does not address the immediate issue of the contraindicated medication. Option C is incorrect because educating the patient about side effects is essential, but only after confirming the appropriateness of the prescription. Option D is incorrect because administering the medication without questioning it could exacerbate the patient's Raynaud's symptoms.